Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Grant Anderson. Grant is the co-founder and CEO of Paragon Space Development. He is a leader in the life support and extreme environment field. Grant has led the systems and conceptual design of multiple spacecraft under contract to Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Sierra Nevada Corporation, SpaceX, NASA, Inspiration Mars Foundation, and others. Prior to launching Paragon, he was the design lead at Lockheed Martin for the International Space Station Solar Array Panels. Grant, welcome to the future of space. Wonderful to be here, dear. Our path has crossed so many times in the last two months, but I'm really glad that finally we get to spend some time together, right? Yeah, no, I, and, and yeah, we're, we were at some very busy events with Yuri's Night and ISDC and Mars, uh, the Humans of Mars panel. So yeah, it's nice to be able to just relax and, and enjoy a good conversation. I promise next time we're going to do that over a bottle of wine. I promise, and I will do it. But for now, before we get into all the great news that's happening in your world and how Paragon got to be what it is today, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? To me, uh, inspiration, future, and um, maybe an odd word for you, dignity. And so uh, do you want me to explain that or do we want to just let those hang? By all means, take the lead. And if you want to, if you want to just focus on the last one, but if you want to explain why these three words and the thought process, please go ahead. Sure. I mean, well, dignity is a theme that I've continued throughout my life. That's in fact, one of the reasons I started Paragon. I felt that some of the larger companies didn't really treat their, their uh, employees with the dignity that was needed. So one of the impetuses for wanting to run my own company was really to do what we call the people department, what, what some people call HR, human resources. And, and, uh, and there's a whole other story behind that, but it really, people's dignity is really tied into doing something that's meaningful to them and meaningful that they can see the rest of the world sees meaning in what they're doing. And I think that us that work in the space industry, it's, it's really meaningful work. It's the future, and that's why it comes that other word I said. It's really where we need to go. It's We have lots of things to do on Earth and make life better on Earth. Part of that is going out, first exploring, and then exploiting space to better humankind in general and better the, the situation that everybody finds in, in, in the world. And ultimately, the dignity of a person is feeling that they're in control of their future and their and that their future has purpose and meaning. And so I think space gives all of that at one time. Um, and then as far as uh, as far as them just tying that all together, all of that is a gestalt, as we say in German, of, of, um, of really talking to your heart to what you, what really makes you want to get up in the morning. And, and so I think space does all of that, especially as in the space industry, but even for people who are, are just peripherally touched by the space industry, it's, it's hard not to be touched by what happens because, with the human endeavor in space. Now that ties really well into the next question, and maybe you just kind of want to elaborate or just tie in. But so beside the science story and the technology story of going to space, there's a human story, and I think that you touch upon it with dignity. But do you want to? Is there more that you want to add to what is that human story of going to space? Yeah, I, I, you know, I did a TEDx talk and I talked about this too, is that, you know, I'm always careful to say that humans do things differently than an, other animals. But, you know, you always, we, back when I was young and you were young, as humans were the only ones who had rational thought. And all of those have been disproved over time. Crows can use tools and all that. So... Our hubris has been slowly knocked down over time as we found more of, of, human, of what's around us in nature. But I think one thing that humans can do that I don't see manifest in other species is we can take joy and pride in the achievements of others. And, and we have a visceral feel. It's why we watch the Olympics, you know, because I can't run 100 meters in 9.2 seconds. But watching somebody do that and do that well and 
work towards a goal and achieve a goal and make a record or win or even just be in the game, you know, make it to the Olympics. Those things are all inspirational for the whole world, not just for the person that's participating. And, and so that's why I think the appeal of space, you know, you go out in the world and you ask, what's the three things you admire most about the United States of America? The moon landing programs will be one of those top three, I guarantee it, 98, 99% of the time, because it was something that the whole world could live viscerally through and feel the inspiration and feel that, that sense of pride. And again, that increase in dignity that says, yes, we're capable of doing these things. So that's really that, the, that human aspect is key. It's key to what we do. And, and uh, it, it makes us, it makes it easier for me to recruit people because when you say you're going to work on human space flight programs, uh, that, that's, um, that's inspirational for people. But I, I think ultimately it touches everybody on earth. I mean, we need those impossible achievements to become possible at some point so that we can like it pulls us as that beacon i mean we we watch you know sir i mean watch we follow i wasn't alive but sir edmund Allery, and hillary you know going up everest or shackleton like pushing those boundaries of what physically it is is possible um, and now it's just about our these these stories of of the ocean exploration uh, explorers getting on those boats and just doing things that it just seems impossible for the common people or just for the regular crowd and now having these moments of wow if this is possible then i can kind of hemp up my 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 scale of of achievable Right. I mean, it's 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 those it's those boundaries that keep being pushed. And I think that the human species, you know, you were saying we don't like to compare ourselves to because they're they're examples of of using tools in nature uh, with wild animals. But I think that the human species has really perfected the ability to go beyond what nature has given us. You know, nature has given us two legs, but. We take the bike, we drive, we take the plane, we go, like we, we, we take what nature is giving us and we, we've taken it to such a higher level. I mean, nature never gave us clothes and never gave us a roof on our head. And yet we build upon that. And now I keep saying that we are giving life for the planet, the biggest gift ever, because we're going to be able to assure the survival of life by taking it to other planets, because if you're going to invest billions of years in developing a life, obviously you don't want to be limited to this single place. You want to make sure that it spreads on the universal level. And the human species is really the only one that's going to be able to do that. Would you agree? Oh, I'm sure we'll take other our friends with you. I'm a, I'm a dog lover, so I want a dog in space. But no, I mean, it's true. It's, it's Tchaikovsky that said, you know, the, the earth is the cradle of mankind, but a baby never stays in the cradle forever. And and we're we're at that stage where we're we're able to get out of the cradle and and actually watch other people watch, watch our brother or our twin brother walk across walk around and we really are twin brothers and sisters when when somebody's out we we, we again feel that it gets rid of all the barriers you just see a person out there um, you know in the case crawling out of the cradle and walking around the room um, pretty soon we're going to explore the whole house and then after that the whole neighborhood we got a, we got a lot of exploring to do so we're just at the beginning stage of this and that's one thing I think that excites my employees and, and other people is is we're in a perpetual business. There, a human is not going to go off of, of Earth without a life support system. Um, you know, we, we can talk about futuristic downloading your computer, to, your brain to a quantum computer and, and heading off. I will I will say that that won't have the same inspiration as have seeing another human like you out there. Um, but we're we're getting going towards that. You know, I think it's a noble goal and. Um, and it, it's something that will impact all future generations. So there's not many jobs you can say where that's going to be true. You know, that, 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 you know, if you were to come back two million years from now, you'll still be able to recognize a life support system. It's, I want to circle back quickly to the, the philosophy of how you do business. You, you mentioned how it is people centric and there are values of for you that are important to, to protect. And, Funny, I was just reading today in the New York Times uh, daily daily email that I get a book that's coming out about J, um, 
GE's famous CEO, uh, Mr. Welsh, that created a different, when GE went from people centric to stakeholders, shareholders, and really GE became more of a finance company trying to turn the profit as much as possible at the expense of, of uh, the people. And the author in the book talks about how this can work on a really short term, but on the long term, it doesn't work. What is, I mean, how, what is your opinion, first of all, of G and Welsh and that style of leadership? And is that something that you're fully aware that you don't want to reciprocate or you never really see it in that way? Well, you know, the, and, and, uh, is it Jack Welsh? I think was his full name. He, he, he was very good at setting goals and then setting financial goals and performance goals. The problem with that is that they also did a rack and stack and they essentially said anybody who's in the bottom 20% has to leave at any time. The problem with that is it generates, um, uh, maladies within the organization. The, 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 the emphasis goes kind of in the wrong place. Um, it's, you know, why Paragon is not a, we're not going IPO. We're not a publicly traded company. I never want to be making bottom line decisions purely on profit potential. It's yes, we obviously make decisions. We're a business. We, we go for things that are profitable. Um, but we don't want to do that at the expense of the human being. And that, that's one thing that, that was key to my starting the company with, with my, my business partners is that. I, I had seen, I'd seen things like in you know, my former company that, that, uh, the average person died after a year after retiring, you know, it was they, they, their whole life was into this work and, and recognizing there's more things important than that. So how do you balance the, the profit, which you have to do with the, with the humanistic aspects of these are humans that are doing something adding value to what they do for a customer. And the way that I balance that is, is by saying, stay focused on the vision and the mission. And, you know, something with the example you gave, yeah, they branched off and did this conglomerate of businesses and finance and financing jet engines and all this other stuff. Maybe they seem logical at the time, but I, if I were in charge of that, I would have spun that off because it's a totally different mindset and keeping focused on what we want to do and being customer centric, I think is one way to, um, mitigate the, the purely bottom line management principles. Um, and you know, you know, that might, if we were publicly traded, my stock just went down by 5% because I said that as opposed to saying, yes, we're going to drive for profits. Um, but I think we're in a different world where we understand there has to be a balance of that. And, and um, uh, profits aren't bad. I'm not a, I'm not a, I, 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 in fact, to me, a profit is just, it's a measure of how well you satisfy a customer versus how much it costs you to, to satisfy the customer and keeping a good spread on that. You know, the iPhone, one of these things does a 300% spread. It takes one third of the money to build it, to sell it. So we put a lot of value in this phone. Um, now, the, the thing I don't get is why would you go somewhere else to get, to get $10 off the top cost of this phone so you can increase your profit margin by 3%. You know, there, there's, there's gotta be a certain balance again to it. Um, and, uh, that might get me drummed out of business school, but, but at the same time, that's why I run my own business. So. <laughs> and it's been successful. You're one of the, I mean, established part of like a uh, player in the field you've been you've been successful for quite some time and now you've just been awarded a new contract in uh, partnership with axiom and it was a bunch of company but it's a it's a major development do you want to share a little bit more about that um that milestone yeah that that is the, the nasa calls it the x evas program which are exploration uh extravehicular um a suit essentially. So it's the space suit that NASA needs to replace the 40 year old space suit they have now. Plus also the last time we built a space suit that you could walk in another body, the Apollo space suit technology has changed a lot since then. So NASA is putting forward a very kind of different contract. It's no longer like build this suit to our specifications and prove it works. It's you guys build a suit. We have certain requirements, but we recognize there's a whole bunch of other people that have requirements too. Build the best suit and we'll, we'll, it has to meet our safety requirements and everything else, but 
we won't dictate you everything about the suit. Um, and and uh, so we are um, with our, our recent uh, acquisition of Final Frontier Design, plus also the spacesuit experience we have from the Stratex program, where we built the spacesuit that's now sitting in the Smithsonian. You can go look at it hanging in a in a uh, in a case uh, at the Everhazy Smithsonian, right behind the left wing of the Air France Concorde. Um, so we, we're combining all that experience to be able to build a suit from the feet to the head. We're on a team with Axiom and, and multiple other partners, and and we're we're going to be building the next generation spacesuits, and and uh, not only for NASA but for a lot of commercial customers. The, the spacesuits don't end at NASA for sure. The, there's, you know, the, this next SpaceX flight with uh, um, with uh, that's non NASA and stuff is going to have a spacewalk on a tethered spacewalk. So they're debuting a a suit that's a lot that's able to do capable of doing EVAs that's going to become a more and more common nobody nobody wants to fly to Cancun just to sit in the hotel room and look at the be look at the ocean you want to go out and play in the water so we feel that the rec the demand for suits is going to be pretty high in the in the not so distant future are you excited about this new reality of having the government and using multiple players that often were seen as competitors, but now everybody seems to be kind of, it's like the market, you know, it's, it's, there's a dynamic energy that is being created and NASA is being, instead of being the one trying to keep control and keep the reins and managing all this, it's basically using itself as that beacon, that, that vision, driving the vision, but le letting the market kind of come up with those solutions. You have, you know, you mentioned Axiom, um, there's you, and then there's other companies that I'm not too sure you want to mention, but you know, there, there's a lot of these companies that at the core of it could be seen as competitors, but now are forced to kind of partner and move forward. Are you excited about this new reality? Oh yeah, I mean, and it's and I don't know how new it is. We've we've always joked that in the space world we have a lot of cooperation. You know, we're cooperating and we're competing at the same time. Uh, one of the things I think that off, that sets apart Paragon is we've always called ourselves an honest broker. I mean, we put together complex systems of life support, and if one of our competitors makes for the application for our customer makes a device that's better than ours, we'll use that one instead. We want the best overall system solution. Um, and you know, at the same time, we're working in the background coming up with something better, so we don't have to do that, but, but we're perfectly willing to because ultimately it comes down to the customer getting the best value for their dollar. And we recognize that and we, we don't shape our contracts to lock our customers into only using our thing. I think that's a, that's a good way to to accidentally become a little complacent when you have a, a tied in market. It's a, I have a, a lot of faith in the, in free market competition. And, and you can argue about how free things are with the government involved and stuff, but ultimately what the, where the trends have gone is to more towards free market competition. And I, 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 I'm sure that that's one of the reasons why space has accelerated so much in the last 20 years uh, because of that. And, and it's really a force that needed to be unleashed in order to really start making progress and really leaping. You know, we're 50 years away from this year from having set foot on the moon. Um, and I have no doubt that if the free market had been available and in, in with the right incentives like they're doing now, we could have been there much sooner. You know, that's that's water under the bridge. There's all sorts of reasons for that. But I think that's been recognized. We've we've tried and innovated not only in the technology but in the contractual side of it uh, in fact i got i got interviewed about five years ago uh or so about well boots on the moon in 2024 do you think we can do it and i said technologically we can do it i don't think that the contractual vehicles can keep up with it in other words the 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 mindset of those that are behind the contracting and you know they're still six months of negotiations and stuff like this. It's like, no, we're in the commercial world. You decide to do, you got the money, you get a contract in place and you start moving. And that takes a month, not six weeks, not six months, not a year. So that I, I, I probably ruffled a few feathers when I said that. I think I was quoted in uh, Quest Magazine when I said that, that technologically we can do it, contractually, I think it would be a problem. So, so we're getting out of that to some degree and, and things are happening a lot faster now, for sure. I mean, change 
takes time or like having even the, the reality of innovation or anything, the, the growth of something, you know, if you plant a tree, it has a capacity to be, you know, 60 feet high, but it's not going to go in one shot, you know, because the amount of energy and, and going against like the amount of work just to achieve that, you have to basically kind of bulldoze your way forward, you know, at the expense of everything else. It has, it's a complicated process. And I think that we, we tend to, to forget that it was just only 40 years ago or 50 years ago that like even the, the, the getting to the sky was like about a hundred years ago. This is absolutely nothing in terms of evolution. And so we manage, you know, to move forward just not too long ago, you know, we had the, the, the reality of the cold war and the space race. And now the technology and 2021 being a tipping point, it is, I mean, I, yes, we can look back and we can say it takes time, but at the same time, it, it goes faster than it, that, that on other places. And I think that's one of the, the success of the American, um, system and where you do have these vision, it's, it's free market, but you don't want this, um, just absolute free market because that would be chaotic. You want to have this competition, but you want to have the legislations or the vision that keep everything in check so they can build on top of that. We're talking earlier about nature. Nature is the same thing. Nature is just this randomness thrown on the wall to see what works, what doesn't work. It works on scales of millions, tens of millions of years, these incremental little changes, you know, done over such a, a big scale. And we don't have that time to wait for that we started to put things on top of it and kind of created a certain structure and foundation that we can build on top of that chaos. Um, so I think that the next 50 to, you know, the next 50 years are going to be absolutely mind blowing in terms of innovation, in terms of where we're going. I assume that you would, uh, you would agree with that. I do. And, and you may, you make a good point, you know, very, Every, every person who works in space has to deal with the question of why spend money doing this when we have so many problems down below. And my answer is we have been. The, the, in the last 50 years, the number of people living in, in abject poverty, even with the, the doubling of the human population, the number of people living in abject poverty has gone down by like 70%. We are making great progress in that area. The number of people dying of weather-related disasters is down 95%. There's... We, what we've, what, what's interesting is, and in my world, of course, of life support, where I'm controlling the environment, <clears throat> in reality, nature is trying to kill you all the time. That's, that's what, what a lot of people don't understand is that the, the, if you can almost point to any uh, forward progress of, of humans as trying to keep getting rid of another way that nature can kill you by solving disease, solving shelter, um, more energy, you know, having heating in the home. There's all these things that are making it safer for us to live. And, and so when we say, well, we shouldn't be spending money on this, we should be spending, we are spending a lot of money and we are improving a lot of things on earth and they've steadily gotten better. Um, and frankly, that is due to free market. It is due to the expansion of, of again, that a little bit of that dignity aspect of allowing people to, have a have a say in their future and in what in what they can do and and it's giving them that that the dignity to make choices for themselves I think really does um, does heighten that and accelerate that whole aspect of of the improvement of the human condition in general. Um, now, one thing about what we do is is it feeds into that. You talk about you know the the technology um, evolution. You know, the, the old saying about a tree, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. And, you know, the, we have things like the, the BPA that's, the, that's recycling water on space station. That started as a kernel of an idea 10 years ago. And it took us 10 years to get from that to a fully operational proven system, hit the goals of 98% you know, water recovery and stuff. We're planting all those seeds and, and the one you know, being 29 years old, Paragon's been in 29, I think one thing we've done well is we may know how to do this, but we're also looking at how will we, we do that better five we're five to 10 years ago. We're actually actively working to 
make our technology obsolete, which may seem strange, but if you've read a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, it talks about the fact that very often companies get building and they build one thing and they fail to see what the next technology disruptor is going to be in their own industry. So that's that's a whole gestalt there, but that whole cycle of innovation and coming back and then and that plus thousands and millions of other people applying their brains is always is bettering the human condition. So it's not an either the or principle. It's not that every dollar you save not spending it on space, it would go towards something good on earth. There's plenty being done on good on earth and, and you can make uh, progress on every front. You know, there's no, it's not a zero sum game on progress. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I wrote about that. And one of the examples that I give, that I give the, uh, the, the audience is if you go back in the 1900s, you had Tesla, the Wright brothers, and Edison. They were all kind of living in the same era. And one could easily argue that, like, there were so many other problems to take care of, disease-wise, society-wise, I mean, everything. And yet you have these three people, four people, I mean, the Wright brothers, are, like, trying to take the sky. Edison and Tesla are trying to power the world. Tesla is, like, on the, on the trip of vision, future trip, and it would be easy to say, well, that was a, such a ridiculous, like, waste of time to put your effort into into the, the, the unthinkable when there were so you know, so many precious issues to take care of. But the world that they created elevated everything and actually took care of some of the problems that we had. And space is going to be that same thing. It's not... It's not a zero sum, but the world that we're going to be creating, the incentives that are in space to be efficient, to be recy to recycle, to be, I mean, once you get that atom of carbon in space, you cannot just throw away that atom of carbon. You're going to have to figure out how to recycle over and over and over again, because you cannot just stop by anywhere and, and resupply for that transformed atom of carbon. It's, it's going to have to be like stays with you and that, technology innovation is going to trickle down to earth. So it's, you know, why do we have artists? Why do we have chefs that are go so out of their way to create a vision of food? I mean, ultimately it just feeds us, but what it is is the human experience. And I, I'm so excited of that next step of creating that human experience in space. And you're right in the middle of it. So I'm pretty sure that you're excited, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, I have a perspective of that. I mean, it's interesting, the three you mentioned, every single one of those people were, well, maybe not Einstein so much, but they were poo-pooed and, and essentially um, told, I mean, they were trying to pass laws in the early 1900s to keep people from flying because all these fools were breaking their neck. You know, my, my grandmother, uh, Wilma Knapp Anderson, born in 1903, which was right around the time of... Uh, of the uh, of the Wright brothers, she remembers watching the Wright brothers demonstrate an airplane in Nebraska when she was a young girl, and then she lived to watch us walk on the moon. And you know, you think about all of that progress that happened in her time, um, and and yeah, that the the progress we're making, we can't even see some of the benefits we're going to have. It's again talking about Ben Franklin when somebody asked him, "Well, well these balloons," when they were watching a balloon go up in Paris. What good is a balloon? He goes, yeah, what, what good is a baby in a cradle? You never know what's going to happen with it. Um, and and uh, you have, I do have faith in that. And maybe that's just the proclivity of me, that that's something that my company's doing, something that, that my employees are doing and thinking about and innovating is going to be something really big in the future that's going to be really beneficial, not just for our com customers, but for humanity in general. Um, and yeah, because of the how we have to think as systems engineers and be thinking about the full carbon cycle, the full nitrogen cycle, the full oxygen cycle, that uh, you know the manifestations, of course, for our technology are very obvious in a closed environment in space. Maybe not quite so obvious when you get to Earth here, where where the air is free, so to speak. Uh, I, I often off start off talks by saying. So how many people left their hotel today worrying about how much oxygen they had for the day? It's it's given to us free here. It's not given to us free when we're out there in the in the cold. 
dark space, which by the way, like I said, is trying to kill you. So all of what we're doing, again, is innovations on ways to make sure that nature doesn't kill us. It just happens to be, we're, we're tempting nature a little bit more in space because it's pretty, pretty harsh up there. I mean, yes, nature is always, from the minute that you come out, nature is, whether the visible or the invisible, the bugs or anything, there's always something trying to, and then, you know, that's how we build our immune system at the same time, by developing these defense mechanism. And then when we go into space, it's just a, a new level of challenges. But I don't believe that I always, when people say like, oh, like going into, into space right now cannot be compared to the era of ocean exploration. What, what I try, the argument that I give back is that these challenges of the past now seem insignificant today because we have an acquired wisdom and we have technologies that can afford us to have a hindsight that is, okay, of course. But in that time, those people risk everything. And, and part of the, 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 the reality of it is that the human cost of exploration in the past was tremendous. People got onto a boat not knowing about vitamin C or sun or food. They would literally go into like this, don't know what's going to happen, get into a place without any maps and thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. And now we have the capacity to send robots. We have a helicopter on Mars that is getting the data so that by the time that we get on that planet, I do believe that the human cost of exploration has tremendously come down and we will not knock on wood, but I don't think that we will see the kind of human cost that, we, that, that we've seen in the past. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think we've, we've, we've become more and more aware of what nature can throw at us. Um, you know, I, I was struck when you were talking about the fact that I had a good friend of mine just a few days ago, uh, it was, no, it was more than a few days ago. Time flies when you're having fun, but they sent me a selfie at the South pole with the, you know, reflective ball there. And, and, you know, they're, they're an ordinary person. They have no exploration credentials whatsoever, but you can go do that now if you have enough money and, and stuff. And, and to some degree, that's my argument with, you know, I have no problem with rich people going to space. They're usually the first always. And, and it's always a good sign when you get the safety down to a level where they're not going out of desperation, but they're going out of adventure. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we as a life support company, and I get to ask this a lot, what's the ethics associated with, say, we're, we're doing the, the, moon, moon, the Mars bound or even a moon base. If something goes wrong, people, people could buy, die. And, and that's been the human condition all along. And, and the main thing in my, my view, at least, is you must explain the risks. You explain what you don't know. And then they make the determination for themselves. Again, it gets back to dignity. It's you're making decisions for your own self your, of, of what is acceptable risk to you. And, um, and as long as I've explained that well, and we've done, you know, we dropped somebody from 135,000 feet and they hit Mach 1.2, you know, outside of an aircraft, uh, intentionally, as they say, um, as long as we explained, they knew the technology, we explained the technology, we explained what could go wrong and what our, what our actions are to help if something goes wrong. You know, we have backup plans and contingencies and stuff. If you explain that to the person and they still go do it and something bad happens and, and, you know, and God forbid it's because something we did wrong in the factory somewhere, but but even those those risks are explained or you might get a bad batch of metal you know or, or, or something else we but you have to just design for that and 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 understand that you do the best you can um a, a perfect example of that is there was a story about apollo 11 where um two of the two of the other astronauts not neil and 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 michael and buzz but we're, we're doing something called walk the rocket, where you go up and down and, and just look at the rocket in the stand. And they were doing that as part of Apollo 11. Now, you're not gonna see anything, but it was kind of a tradition to go do this. And there was a technician with their head in a panel and they the technician popped his head out when they were going by and they said, do you really think this thing's gonna work tomorrow? And the technician said, well, I don't know about everything else, but everything I worked on is gonna work. 
And as long as everybody has that attitude, um, you're going to be successful. And things happen. Things happen, and you and and we all like nobody in the space industry ever wishes anybody a, a problem because we know that there, but for the grace of God, go us. So go I. So we're always rooting for everybody. It doesn't matter if they're a deep competitor and you've just lost a billion dollar contract to them or something. We wish everybody the best in what they do because we want, all want to be successful. I find it incredible every time that you think of what was needed for a helicopter on Mars, a, a place that we've never been, having this, this satellite, this rover being put up the top of a rocket, sh shot through the space, travel for, for millions of miles, land on this planet through like a crane, and then from under the rover, getting this helicopter that now flies and still flying, it, either that or the collaboration on James Webb, you know, all these countries that came together and worked for decades for something that there were so many point of breaking the, like, uh, someone was telling me, like, the James Webb, usually NASA does these, like, you know, if something breaks, it has to have all these contingencies. The James Webb was just, like, one after the other, a single point break that if it didn't work perfectly, nothing would work. And here it is now on this conceptual orbit, again, that we've never been to, all math. I mean, if these two projects don't inspire the capacity that what space can bring to people, I think, you know, you have a different argument, but everything that you've been saying reflects that, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that is probably that ability to cooperate on details of a very complex system and make it work is almost more valuable to humankind than the technology itself. Um, that ability to work together and across different disciplines. Frankly, it's one of the reasons that I was enthusiastic about starting Paragon is I, the one part about, you know, I could have built satellites for a living, you know, the communication satellites, billion dollar industry, and could have maybe worked my way up in that. But building a robot wasn't and all, all of communication satellite is a robot in a really cool place, really. Uh, but, but throwing in that human aspect and the, the, the uncertainty of humans and, and the difficulty of designing around humans was all part of the allure to me of, of doing what I'm now doing is that human aspect. I, I was a plane nut, excuse me, when I was a kid and, and it was the same reason is it, it wasn't the technology was interesting, but the having designed it so that it does something useful for humans and works with humans and works to keep humans from hurting themselves. And all of those aspects are all intellectually very stimulating when you're trying to solve a problem. I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, that's where I went. <laughs> well, talking about this is where you went when you were talking about envisioning the future and not doing things that we assume are going to happen, but going beyond the extra step. You know, I'm always reminded of Wayne Gretzky playing the hockey and just always saying, like, I'm not shooting where the player is. I'm shooting where it's going to be and where I want him to be. And Steve Jobs was the same thing. You know, if you let the customer tell you what they want, you'll give them, you know, they don't have, you need that visionary, you need that on that mindset of trying to build the future, but at the same time remain agile and resilient because you cannot know what is going to like we i think like in the past if someone had said you know imagine the future okay spaceship all that kind of stuff but these little these little devices or medicine all these 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 breakthrough innovation that's not the kind of stuff that people think about the future but they become part of that foundation that allows us to build on that on that future so what would your advice for any companies that are going to, not just going to space, but in general, that one of the, the, the most important characteristic of the company is being resilient and developing, nurturing resilience and being agile and adapting as the future uh, comes your way? Yeah, well, and I, I think to be a good company, you have to do that. Uh, you know, you, you have to be, to be a great company, 
it's a little what you said about Gretzky of, of firing where, where that customer is going. And, and I can't really put a, a label on it, but that's, that's something that only a few people can do is, is it's easy to, you go out to a customer and you say, how could I do better? And they give you ideas. Um, the other thing that you mentioned with like, even like the, the, the Mars helicopter to see how they built it interests me. What I'd really love is a report on what did they, what did not work? What didn't work? Like they thought, you know, the bearings wore out faster than they thought, or we had this issue. That's the problems that actually interest me more because the problems then inspire me to look at what might solve those problems in the future. And I think that's where you get to that ability to lead the customer and to lead the, to lead the player to make sure the hockey pucks in the right place so you can score a goal. And, um, so I would say to, you know, giving advice and I, I do mentor a few CEOs of small companies and stuff, um, is, is really understanding where other people have been and what mistakes they've made and, and what problems we're having with the current solutions that opens the door for the innovation. And then there's all sorts of other aspects of being well read, you know, keeping up on things that even don't seem quite connected to your industry, but they could. Um, uh, it, I think it happens to be a curious character for sure. And, and anybody who's going to lean an organization into the future. It's about moving forward with acquired wisdom rather than looking backward and trying to blame someone because the path to you know, the, the innovation and the mistake are exactly, the path to those are exactly the same. The only difference is the hindsight. You know, every time that you're trying to achieve something, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Once it doesn't work, then you can look back and you can say, well, you know, okay, let's try something else. But two people can do exactly the same thing and one is going to be an innovation and then the other one is going to be a mistake. And there's no solution, there's no equation in life that says you have to do five mistakes to get one discovery. You have to fail 50 times so that you get that ah oh, moment. So we're always kind of like fishing in the dark, moving forward in the dark, and no one wakes up in the morning trying to do the wrong thing or trying to do the bad thing. I mean, even plastic were thought that they were good and going to be such a, you know, a benefit for the planet. So I think that we have to remind ourselves of that messiness of life and growth so that we can move forward empowered rather than trying to point the finger backward and spend so much energy trying to find the, the culprit of, of like, and that, that, and then play the victim. Um, I think that like in space is really, I think infused this, this, this spirit of moving forward. And I think that's what gets you um, moving in the, in the morning, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's this saying that the fail fast, you know, the, the, the one thing about you said about all the, you could, you, there's no formula of try five things. The sixth one will be successful or whatever, The guarantee to failure. If you don't try anything that that's a guaranteed failure, right? You, you, in order to make progress, the, you know, the, the, the cool thing about doing things is it gives you the ability to do more. You, you, it allows you to build on steps. Um, and in that way, you know, I admire Elon Musk. That's what he's done. He's, you know, let's go and do this. And if it blows up, it's like, okay. And we've had other customers like that, that are like, oh, you had a failure. Cool. Why was that? Let's fix it. You know, and, and which is very refreshing from the, oh, okay. You're going to pay for that. Right. With <laughs> some customers. Right. Um, and in the innovation world, you're going to have failures and, and, uh, we recognize that and, and you, you, you have to design in a certain resiliency of your organization, um, to be able to take failures because you're, you're going to have some, but, but in the end of it all, yes, you, you will never succeed if you don't try and you take measured risks. And, you know, one of the things that, that I, I, talking about the past, one, one of my best experiences back in, it was like 2003, I walked into a guy named Hank Rotter's office down at NASA. And he was in charge of doing the environmental control with, for the space shuttle. He had started on the Apollo program, late in the Apollo program in 67. And I went into Hank and I said, Hank, tell me all the mistakes you've made. Because when I make a mistake, I want it to be called the Grant Anderson mistake. I don't want to be called the, the Hank Rotter mistake that Grant made again, because he was, he didn't know about it. And Hank cleared his calendar for like four and a half hours and sat there with me 
and went through all of the things that went wrong with the development of the space shuttle and some of the things that went wrong on this on Apollo. It was one of the best educations I've ever had. And I think, you know, not to my own horn, but that's one thing that I really recommend is, and, and I know Elon does this well too, go find the experts and then find out what they've what they've already know about the mistakes. So don't repeat somebody else's mistakes. You wanna, literally, I want the mistake to be the Grant Anderson mistake. Cause if it was unique, it means I was trying something new that nobody had thought of before. Um, and and so don't be scared of failure is the other thing. It's, you know, you, you use measured risk and you, may, you think about your risks, uh, but don't let it keep you from trying because that's the sure failure method. Absolutely, wisdom being spoken. As we, uh, as we close on, uh, Grant, if people want to know more about Paragon and if they want to work, uh, I'm pretty sure that like many other companies you're hiring right now, uh, where can they go? Well, um, on my website, our website is www.paragonsdc.com. So Paragon Sierra Delta Charlie uh, stands for Space Development Corp.com. And there is a careers page, uh, careers tab. You go in there. It has all open requisitions. It, it will... Uh, redirect you to a applicant pro site where you can fill out an application. If you can't find one that's specific to your, because we have thermal engineers, mechanical, like I said, I'm in a multidisciplinary business. We need everything from chemists and biologists to mechanical engineers, but not to mention the, all of the business finance and, and uh, the you know, buyers and you know, everybody else. Uh, we, we need a diverse set of people. Um, if you don't find your, your one requisition that fits you perfectly, put in a general one because we watch those too, because sometimes people, in fact, some people you can't put in a pigeonhole because they've done so many things are actually a very interesting person to us because multidisciplinary is one of the things we look for. And the other one is um, that you've worked with your hands and built things and done stuff. You know, that, that's, you know, I, I often say that uh, if you were grew up on a farm or if you've been to military technical training school, we'll give you a second look right away because no, no farmer's child ever went into his parents and said, I won't milk the cows today because the milk machine's broken. They friggin' well fix the milking machine. And you, and you need that sort of stick to it and get it done type attitude. And, and that's, that's important to us too. But that's our, our website, www.paragonsdc.com. If they want to be an intern, then obviously could contact the company because that's the path to getting your foot in the company. And I mean, there's so, I love the fact that like you have specifically this, this request for people who don't see themselves within those roles, but want to be part of it. And you do think about them. So congratulations, congratulations on that. Grant, mm -hmm. it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us your wisdom, your experience, and uh, for building this vision of the future that is so exciting. And I'm looking forward for our, our path to cross again. Looking forward to it, Daniel. I'm, I'm sure it will sometime soon. <laughs>